or for the rest of the day, I will uh, ask all the participants who would speak in the microphone a trick. If you lean the mic slightly to the cheek, the sound will be perfect. But to, not today, today, not in cheek, but here, to cheek, sorry. The sound will be perfect because then it follows your head when you twist it. So that is good. Okay, and now we will follow the same procedure as we did yesterday in the previous sessions, meaning that we will have an opening speech today by Mr. Jonah Rosenberg. After that, we will have uh, three panelists, and I will introduce them when it's time for that. And after that, we have some time for questions, and the end, in the end, it will be some remarks by Dr. Indy Lumpur. So, uh, as I said, the speech, the opening speech today will be held by Joran Rosenberg, who is a uh, respected journalist and author. Uh, he has won numerous prizes, both for his journalistic work and for his authorship. Uh, among them, the, I would say, prestigious August Prize for a book titled, uh, I'm not sure about the English translation, but I think it is uh, a brief stop on the route from Auschwitz from 2012. And that book has also been translated to, to uh, many languages, among them Hebrew. So, Joram, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, it's a, first of all a great honor, but it's also a great uh, experience to giving this talk in this building. This is the first time I enter here. And I must say, uh, if Jewish life could live up to the building it has been given, I would be very, very happy. It's great, as far as I can see. It was hard to get in, but that's fully understandable. And I think the guy who was sitting there didn't know if I was coming in or going out, so he opened the same door, uh, the outdoor, a couple of times. But eventually he also opened the door that led into this holy, uh, center of Jewish life. I wouldn't say wholly generally, but I think part of it should be considered that. Of Jewish life in Stockholm, and perhaps in a way in Sweden too. And it has been given the very significant name of Bayit, and I understand that Bayit then has been the inspiration for the theme of this conference, which is about home, and not uh, a contested or contested notion. A simple notion it isn't, but it is contested, and I will try to complicate the notion. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in my life, uh, the notion of home, or I would rather say or start, the notion of place has been very, very simple. It, it might come as a surprise for people who see me as a guy flying around and Anyone who read my last book, and anyone actually who read all my other books, will notice that they all start, with one exception, in a very, very small place. Even if the book is about the United States, or about Israel, or about anything, about my father, definitely, it starts in this small place, and that's the place of my childhood. That's really strange, uh, in a way, because I didn't think of it. <coughs> it's just in hindsight I noticed that that's how I begin. Somehow that's where I get the strength and the energy to write my books. And, and then I somehow extricate myself from that place and go out in the world. A little bit like, you know, if we read The Little Prince by Saint Exupéry, the little prince who has this little planet of his own. And in this little planet there is a rose. And he's completely convinced that this is the only rose in the world. And that's his rose. And he tends to it. Really loves the rose. It's his rose. But then he travels, of course. That's the whole point of this book. And he comes to another planet, and he, to his horror, initially discovers it's full of roses, other roses. So that little rose of his wasn't that unique, particular rose of his, but part of the world. But his uh, itinerary out in the world to 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 to, to uh, to love all the roses of the world, if we can say so, was by loving one particular rose, and then expanding his, his view of the world. 
As I say, this might be a very particular thing with me, and there are other places that in my life that I'm very much attached to, with lasting bonds of memory. Uh, but the place of our childhood, at least my childhood, is the place where I first saw the world, literally first saw the world, and I saw everything for the first time. If you don't believe in reincarnation, that's the first time you see the world. And, uh, and uh, you gave everything you see its first name. You have a language. And you give everything you see its first name. And that place, I think, is very significant to each and every one of us. But it really is, uh, I have been contemplating about this much more, perhaps, than, than other people. I don't know. And maybe it's a personal oddity, maybe I'm the more place-bound type of human being. There are people who will argue that they can be at home anywhere. Um, and um, it, it's also perhaps, and I will come back to it, uh, due to, to peculiarities in my, my biography, my history. Uh, but, uh, and there were people who would say this obsession, but it is some, somehow, if you see that, the way I write, then you will, might say it's an obsession <laughs> with place, and, 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 and many people would say that's atavistic today, obsolete. Why do you do? Why, why do you keep clinging to that? We live in a globalized, rapidly globalizing world where the attachment to place and, and the quest for home, in that sense, uh, associated with place, has been considered a bit a primitive remnant from from a pre-globalized era of more limited mobility and more, and more local horizons. A lingering nostalgia, perhaps, that may all too easily become the source of populist resentment, ethnic nationalism, and xenophobic fear. And, of course, a German word, Heimat, with its <coughs> historical connotation to the Nazi <coughs> ideology, Blut und Boden, blood and soil, undoubtedly impregnates uh, the notion of home with the sentiments of attachment and belonging to a particular place. And there is no denying the destructive potential of high in the history of Europe. So needless to say, I have no wish to make the place of my attachment the foundation of an ideology or a source of resentment, and even less so a cause for, for strife and war and Heavy. But neither do I wish to renounce or suppress a relationship that I believe has formed my life in a way or in ways not fully, fully explicable. I would even go further and argue that attachment to place is an intrinsic, is, is as intrinsic to human existence as is the need of hope. And now I will come into that notion. A home can certainly be uh, many things, and it may, can mean many things. I mean, Hebrew, the word bayit means many things, and I will come back to that. But the physical and, and human environment in which we evolve into human beings and, and make our way into the world is arguably a place that will stay with us and shape us, whether we are aware of it or not. The science of the lasting effects of childhood experience tells us this, and it's convincing to me. And so does, as I've indicated, the story of my family. People who know me here and have read my book perhaps know this. And it tells me that the significance of such a place as home to a human being will, more, will be more conspicuous in its absence than in its presence. It's like the air. You don't notice it until it's gone. It's natural. Home is our natural environment in which we can exist as human beings. So to be deprived of it wholly and radically, including the memory of it, or rather the faculty, the ability to remember it, will make for a lasting sense of homelessness. That I think has become part of my biography. And when I late in life began to write uh, a brief stop on the road from Auschwitz, it's a childhood memoir of my father whom I lost at the age of 11. <coughs> so I had really to uh, recall.
course, to, to the child's memories, and that's not very easy to do. Uh, first of all, a child that doesn't pay much interest, as I have to all say, in the history of their parents, not in the beginning at least, and you don't see many things. But what I could see as a child, what I could get a glimpse of occasionally, was a man or a human being in with his frantic, incessant attempts to survive that loss or the loss of that kind of home that is essential to us as human beings and which spells not roof over your head but ground under your feet. A place in the world where you can stand. In the case of my father, the ground was cut from his, under his feet in a most thorough and irrevocable way, as we know, in the Holocaust, leaving him to cope not only with the radical loss of home, but of his sense of human value as well. The humiliation and dehumanization of victims was instrumental to the Nazi extermination project. Having survived physical extermination didn't mean that you had withstood the prior mental destruction. After having survived Auschwitz, my father had to survive the survival itself as a human being. And as a child, I, as I said, I could only get a whiff of what that really meant. And maybe the particular story of my father's attempt to regain his foothold in a small industrial town in Sweden uh, may not lend itself to, to broader generalization. People lose their homes for, for various reasons and other <coughs> shifting circumstances. And they differ as to their possibilities and abilities to deal with their situation. But it has certainly made me aware of the crucial significance of something called home, of being at home, and the terrible, terrible affliction of homelessness. Surviving the Holocaust made for an extraordinarily harsh experience multiple and severe losses. In the case of my father eradicating every remnant and repressing, I would say, every memory that might have been attached to him because it was too painful. So. I will come back to the to the broader issue of home, but I'll let me, since we are in a house called Bait and in an institution called Paideia, which is not Hebrew, but it's a, it deals with serious Jewish matter. Let me address it shortly the, the particular Jewish dimension. I'll try to, I'm not an expert as well, but the issue of home and homelessness. Uh, and without having to take the experience of the Holocaust into account, uh, we know that this a, there is a particular Jewish dimension to this matter. And that is, of course, due to the fact that exile and dispersion have been fundamentally featured positive Jewish existence, <coughs> diasporic Jewish existence, although there was diaspora as we know of the Bible, so it's, not, it's really not accurate. So I think exile and dispersion is the main, main Jewish experience, while national existence is a small blip of the historical curve of Jewish existence, <coughs> but important, of course, for many other reasons. So it's not only fundamental uh, in the sense that they were the tragic outcome, exile, existence of, of destruction and, and disaster and defeat. Of course, destruction of the temple at the center of this. So what do we call the temple? Bayit. Khorban Habayi, destruction of the temple. Bayit can also, if you know, mean house, except home, you can mean house, it can mean a tribe. All the tribes in its own bet something. Bet David, bet. it can be a nation. But in the sense that they eventually, uh, these experiences became the fundamental Judaism, as we know it. A people making its home in a book, if you can say that. The people of the book, the notion of the people of the book, is also the notion of a people that gave a new significance to the meaning of home. This didn't mean that the book replaced home in, 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 in the traditional sense. You still needed to live somewhere, and you had to, to, to make a living somewhere, and feel safe somewhere. 
And it did definitely not mean that the notion of home in that sense became less significant in Jewish life. I would rather argue the, the other way around because it was always threatening. With the specter of material and political hopelessness always more imminent, the centrality of home to human existence was perhaps even more evident in the Jewish experience. The Jewish homes that were formed by the territory of the book, if you would say, still had to satisfy all the needs, the other needs of human existence, material and social and cultural and existence. So the continuation of Jewish existence was, was wholly dependent on its ability to uphold and preserve this seemingly fragile notion of home, based not then on territory, not on armies, not on kings or queens or politicians, but on the authority and the community of the book, generally said. The book. This didn't mean that Jewish life was somehow independent of and armies and all these things. On the contrary, Jewish life blossomed when the home of the book found a cultural and territorial environment in which it could find material and political safety and with which it was allowed to interact, mutually interact. And it declined and became ossified by Mayardi when it was forced to exist in material and political deprivation. The Jewish home, then, with its fundaments in memory and hope, I have to add that very important fact, must, thus, as, as a matter of survival almost, be an open home, with a door not only open to a stranger and the needy, and the prophet Elijah occasionally, but also to the world that surrounded it. It has been said that the Jewish home is not of the world, and we could argue about what that means. But it certainly must be a home in the world. A Jewish home that walls itself off from the world, or is a walled off from the world by others, runs the risk of losing touch with the world, which in my vocabulary is what homelessness is all about. Losing touch with the world, not belonging in the world. The idea that Jews somehow could do with less home, embodied in the midst of the you know, wandering Jew, uh, the notion of the Jews as cosmopolitans, etc., is in my view to completely misunderstand the, to the extent to which the continuation of a dispersed but distinct Jewish civilization has been dependent on its ability to provide a home and a sense of belonging to its members. <coughs> and there is, of course, no inherent Jewish desire to live a life of territorial disruption and deprivation to wander from place to place. The expression Dina de Malchuta Dina is not an expression of weak loyalty to a particular place, but rather the opposite <coughs> of the desire for a place where a loyalty or even a strong loyalty is reciprocated. A place of permanence, predictability, and belonging. I do not have to add that the notion of home in Jewish life <coughs> at the moment is a subject of discussion and controversy due to the fact that there is now in existence a nation state claiming to provide that territorial home, a national home for the Jews of the world, which is a new thing, as we know. In <coughs> it is then perhaps a paradox that the national home, more or less ethnically and culturally defined, while finally becoming a very <coughs> option as well, appears to be increasingly ill-suited to accommodate the need for home in a world of globalization and migration, leading to an increasing cultural and ethnic diversity, or a pressure for an increasing ethnic and cultural diversity within the borders of the nation states of the world. The stranger is not across the border, but he is your next door <coughs> neighbor. One can then, as I return to my earlier discussion, ask yourself, does the notion of home then really matter as much as it once did? 
And uh, there was a period, not long ago, I call it the brief era of triumphant globalization, with its promises of frictionless communications. We couldn't even imagine how fast that would change and go, but still even then, an increasingly borderless world in many aspects at least, financial aspects uh, and others, it was, anyway, it was indeed tempting in, in such a world which you could really access, at least visually, in an instant. It was tempting to declare obsolete the rootedness of human existence in particular settings and circumstances. You could really, was the vision, make your home anywhere, easy. And was this notion of the global village, this beautiful notion, it was both a village where you knew everybody and felt at home, and it was global. But uh, and so the global village, the, the, the place of the global village then would, would result in, inexorably reduce the significance of place-bound local territorial bonds of community. But as globalization, as we all know, began to bad things, financial turmoil, political disaffection, social dislocation, and fear among segments of the population. The demarcation lines of identity and belonging again began crisscrossing the European landscape. Adding to this the immediate, one has to say, the immediate dislocating effects of rapid and large-scale migration and it's not hard to see why the spectre of homelessness might again come to haunt the European societies in particular. And this time around, people will not necessarily have to leave home to sense the ground under their feet shaking. While a more globalized and multicultural social order might seem the logical step for an ever more interdependent, interconnected, there can, I would argue, be no globalization without societies that are able to provide their members with a community to which they can belong and a place in which they can be at home. Human formation, I would argue, becoming a human being can occur under the most diverse circumstances and produce the most diverse human beings but it cannot reasonably occur without the intimate, physical, and emotional interaction with the people who ha happen to inhabit the particular world into which each and every one of us, without being asked, unfortunately sometimes, has been delivered. We don't choose who we, where we start our lives. To feel at home in the larger world, then, like the little prince, we must first make ourselves at home in the small world of our first encounters and impressions. Home, in that primordial sense, is not, I would say, an option, but a necessity. The kind of homelessness that was experienced by my father and so many other people uh, persecuted and humiliated by the Nazis has been the source of a lot of reflection, particularly on the notion of home and homelessness. I will mention, and I mentioned in my book, of course, the Austrian Jewish writer Jean Améry, who was born Hans Meyer, but after the being subjected to the torture of the Gestapo and deportation and Auschwitz and having survived all that, he renounced not only his old name and changed it to Jean Amory, and he also resented his own language, the language into which he was born, the language in which he gave everything their first names. It was a traumatic, traumatic experience to, to, to a person like him. To him, the destruction of home and language constitu constituted, constituted a state of irreparable homelessness, to be seen as, uh, and I can see that as, as a, a very clear in, in everything he writes. 
and he asked in one of his essays, he asked, uh, how much home does a person need? He actually uses the word Heimat in his piece, because eventually he's forced to write in German, and he does. Uh, the more of it, the less he can carry with him or her, he answers himself. And uh, I think this is so, so, uh, such a crucial experience, and, and perhaps that is it's the main experience that I, I have taken with me, that when you don't have any links at all to that first place, of the world, there's no remaining links to the land of one's childhood and youth, as Henri writes. And then your capacity to attach yourself to the world is weak. You will be less able to be at home in the world in general. You, can, you will make it, you can make it, but it's difficult. It's more difficult. And eventually it might be, become an unbearable state of being and of existence. It will be too hopeless, too difficult. You will feel too alone, too existentially alone. In the world. And perhaps is it only by being able to imagine ourselves in such a situation, being abandoned by our own world, that we might fully grasp the centrality of home and belonging to human existence. A person like Hannah Arendt, I think, was completely formed by her early experience of being rejected by her own world, her own German intellectuals in Germany. And she's, this comes back in all her writings and in, in the origins of totalitarianism. The, the notion of statelessness is crucial. I think that forms of, and the statelessness is being abandoned into a kind of, uh, existential loneliness that is unbearable. <coughs> and she also uh, uh, is very, very critical of the notion that we are only human being, and that the human being itself, an individual, can carry uh, and can, 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 can carry the value of humanity. <coughs> you are giving your, the value of being at home with other people. And so she was, uh, I don't have the quote, but, but the idea that there is something called the naked human being, and that is what human being is about. She found absurd that the naked human being is an abandoned, lowly human being. Mm -hmm. And this could carry us on in a discussion about how we see the issue of human rights, human values, so forth. I will leave that, but it's, it, it really, to me, it's very important that there is no way you can take out the individual out of his home and as, as attach to him or her an intrinsic value, the value is given by the, by other human beings, or in the interaction with other human beings. Let me talk a bit uh, politics then. Uh, so what do we do? I mean, we live really in a world where the notion of hope is contested, is difficult. Uh, the old structures that we used to erect to, to do that, uh, nation states, tribes, uh, whatever have you, are not working. Anymore. And if people argue that they work, they are wrong. It will not work. It will be completely destructive. It will not give us the sense of, of, of security and being at home that people, populist demagogues, argue that they walls and borders will not provide that anymore. I would say. The European structure, which is now called the European Union, that evolved meant eventually after these two near fatal disasters in less than 30 years in Europe may today be understood as the most ambitious and certainly the most legitimate and peaceful attempt in European history to create a common political order for the numerous peoples in this small and fractured peninsula on the western tip of the Eurasian continent. You have to remember how small Europe is and how densely and diversely populated it is. People really climbing on each other in places. <coughs> Not easy. Or to put it in the word, what needed to be created was a sort of a common house for very many homes. Some of them built on the ruins of other homes, as we know, the product of wars and ethnic cleansings and, and things like that. Very complicated. Too much history on too small a territory, one would say, uh, perhaps. When the Cold War uh, suddenly ended in 1989 and the conditions for a new European order radically changed, the existing community, the European community, then of 12 nations, simultaneously embarked on a policy of enlargement aiming at a 
far-reaching economic convergence in order to establish a close economic and uh, monetary and eventually a political union, enabling the introduction of also a common currency, as we know. And in the mood of, I would say, euphoria that prevailed at that time, there was no hesitance, there was no, there was no discussion really whether what, that, what, 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 what this really would take. When ferocious nationalism, uh, nationalism uh, emerged in the, in the Balkans in the early 90s, that could and was too easily interpreted as yet another argument for pursuing the European project at full throttle, emphasizing the need then to embrace the fringe European uh, nation states. But what, what was not pursued at, at the same time uh, was uh, or at least what was not taken into consideration was, and I would then say this in the, in the, in the, in the, in the terminology of this essay, the need of hope, and also the need of legitimacy, and actually uh, the need of a de of, of democratic institution that would bind this house in one way or another together. So as EU rapidly widened and deepened, deepen and widen at the same time, which we, with hindsight could argue whether that was a good thing, then increasingly the, 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 the increasingly disparate members of this year, disparate homes, if you so wish, were to remain the highest level of democratic decision making and the only and ultimate source of political legitimacy. And herein, I would say, uh, lay the built-in weakness of the present European order, with European leaders unable or unwilling to create a demos of European people of some sort, or a community, and make the EU a democratic federation of sorts, a conflict between nation-state democracy and European-level decision-making, what we call the democratic deficit, I think was inevitable. Also put it in terms of this, this presentation, the conflict between an order catering or trying to cater or expected to cater to our need of home and belonging and an order increasingly unable to provide it. One could argue that, and I will argue, that I think this ambition to make Europe that same kind of home as the nation state wants us provided was misguided. I, I don't think Europe in, can become a home in that sense. And with a possibility, and it's a real possibility, I would say, of a structural breakdown of the European Union in its present form, I think we have to reconsider somehow both structure and idea, both form and content, because we cannot have a structure uh, based on a widening split fissure between power and legitimacy. And as I say, this idea cannot, I think, be based on the notion of Europe as a whole, with flags and anthems and what have you. We try, we try to emulate the nation state of Europe can never become a home in the <clears> sense of Heimat, and not even in the sense of another German word, which I now would introduce, Gemeinschaft. That term was introduced in a political debate by a German uh, sociologist, some of you might have heard about him, Ferdinand Tönnies, in 1887. And that was for him a term that denoted a human community held together by the bonds of love, friendship, neighborliness, and blood, as well as binding traditions of collective memories. In contrast, uh, there was the notion of Gesellschaft, a human community principally held together by bonds of utility. Gemeinschaft relations are prevalent, he argued, in family, tribal, clan, or nation, or any other social circuit, trusting and warm enough to make us act out of a duty or obligation or love. Gesellschaft relations prevail in societies where trust is becoming increasingly depersonalized making us act from expectations of utility and reciprocity. 
The step from being loyal to a family or a tribe to being loyal to a nation state was not an obvious and, and is not an obvious and natural one. Many, many, history knows many forms of society where tribal loyalties have remained the widest loyalties possible, <coughs> and where the limits of justice have been subsequently determined by tribal feuds and fortresses. Yeah. <coughs> history also tells us that once a larger loyalty is established, it might quickly be dissolved into smaller loyalties again. So, it seems apparent by now, I would argue, that no European order will be able to emulate the element of Gemeinschaft that was instrumental in building the democratic nation state once. Europe can never become a home to its inhabitants in the same way as once at least was Sweden or Denmark or any other society conceived on the premise of an imagined ethnic and cultural community. Imagine. What the nations and peoples on the European continent have at best managed to create and temporarily sustain is a series of European gesellschafts, temporary arrangements, or rather fragile political agreements and contracts between numerous competing <coughs> and conflicting histories, languages, cultures, religions, traditions, and memories. Transnational European elites, from crusaders and clerics to financiers and bureaucrats, have all been linked by relations of Gesellschaft rather than by relations of Gemeinschaft. And none of them have managed to provide Europe with a lasting, harmonious building for its all too many homes. Not even the most democratic and legitimate of European organizations, the European Union. On the contrary, with many homes of Europe being increasingly borderless, large-scale migration reshaping the landscape the inhabited, large-scale migration reshaping the landscape the inhabited, globalization shaking the ground on which they are built, and the specter of homelessness at home, as I call it, are shaking the ground on which they are built generating <clears throat> genuine fears, leading to the all human questions about who we are and where we belong are again becoming increasingly pervasive and frustrating and under the present circumstances tend to produce desperate and destructive answers. The transition from Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft, wrote the American political thinker Francis Fukuyama once, constitutes an intensely alienating process that has been negatively experienced by countless individuals in different societies. The current appeal of radical Islamism to young people of Muslim origin raised in the heart of European societies may thus in part be understood as the appeal of the promise of home and belonging to people caught in the empty space between a Gemeinschaft lost and a, 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 a Gesellschaft a, a Gemeinschaft lost and a Gemeinschaft deemed uh, inaccessible. It makes no more sense to see, and I quote Fukuyama, to see today's radical Islamism as an inevitable outgrowth of Islam than to see fascism as the culmination of centuries of European Christianity. Fukuyama also added a warning that the, if the wider community fails to satisfy the needs of identity, there will be a plethora of narrow communities, more or less imagined, more or less open to each other, promising identities galore, inhabited by people more sure about who they are, might come back and rise to the task again, as we see. The French sociologist Alain Touvain once coined the term demodernization process arising out of the failure of modern society to maintain the link between the world of economy, market and technologies and the world of collective and individual identities. <coughs> what kind of social order then such a process might lead to in an era of unprecedented global interdependence and interconnectedness we can hardly imagine and perhaps we don't dare to. How then can the current European order be reconstructed to prevent this process, what we may call demodernization or whatever, 
And my answer, very Quixotic, as it might seem at this point in time, is to reconsider. And this, hold your breath now. Reconsider the idea of federation, which is still the only idea around a peacefully negotiated social order, explicitly constructed to accommodate multitude and diversity. The European Gesellschaft, the structure of, of uh, or, a, or, or, a, or a building in which the all too many homes, I say that because of the, all the conflicts that we have had, old and new, large and small, could be peacefully accommodated. Reviving and rehabilitating the much maligned idea of federation is the only way to take the contentious and divisive issue of home and belonging in Europe seriously, without abandoning the idea <coughs> of a common European order. If anything, the American uh, motto, a pluribus unum, out of many one, the original motto of the American Federation, is more relevant to the European condition, where the historical and cultural diversity is larger and the record of disunity and discord arguably more disastrous, and the need for a common order, therefore, even more compelling. In a speech in Zürich in September 1946, uh, quite a famous speech, Winston Churchill then uh, gave a stark, stark description. He actually, in that speech, also talked about the need for a, a common European project, a common European <coughs> Union, actually. I don't know if he thought Britain should be part of it, but anyway. <laughs> uh, he, he gave a stark description of the human landscape at that time, 1946, still visible across Europe. And I quote him A vast, quivering mass of tormented, hungry, careworn, and bewildered human beings who wait in the ruins of their cities and homes and scan the dark horizons for the approach of some new form of tyranny or terror. Among the victors there is a babel of voices, among the vanquished the sullen silence of despair. <coughs> Seventy years later the babel of voices can be heard again. There may be no sullen silence of despair, but those voices are shrill, expressing fear and resentment, telling us that we must take very seriously the possible consequences of yet another European tragedy. So where are we in all this? We, the Jews, whatever that means today. And to be honest, I'm not sure I know what it means. <laughs> Do we still have the will and the capacity to confront a particular Jewish historical and existential predicament? deeply rooted in our texts, in our rituals, in our memories, and in our hopes to be strangers among other people. To be the ones, therefore, to remember what it means to be at home and not to be, and what this memory perhaps demands of us, namely, and I will quote this for the second time this morning, to treat the stranger who resides with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, you who are aliens in the land of Egypt, I am the Lord, your God. I also happen to believe that this specific Jewish experience of home and homelessness, the stranger as your neighbor, the stranger as yourself, is a far more relevant reflection on the present of the present human condition than the elusive quest for a home created and protected by closed walls and borders. <coughs> how to accommodate the wish for difference with the need for belonging, to be at home and not to be, which could be said to be the historical challenge of a mainly diasporic Jewish, which to be said to be the historical challenge of a mainly diasporic Jewish civilization, which has become, I would believe, the challenge 